Okay, welcome to Aero 206 MATLAB. And the first thing we're going to do is jump into learning how to use MATLAB. I've got MATLAB open in front of me here. Hopefully you've already got it installed. If not, refer to the installation instructions uh, that are on the team site. There's one uh, part that sometimes people stumble with, and that's setting your username. Uh, basically, if your username is showing up as DF Local on your um, EDU laptop, then only the administrator will be able to run MATLAB. So you need to be able to need to set the username in MATLAB to your username. And in order to do that, you need to follow these instructions here. Part of those instructions is getting to a command prompt. So you can just click the start button and type in CMD and press enter and that'll open up a command prompt. And then you can type in set username and get your username, then tell MATLAB to install for that user and then you'll be able to run it uh, easily. I'm running MATLAB 2021B up here, and you can type in ver at the command line to see the version that you're running. And here's all of the toolboxes um, that I have installed. The main one that you'll need is the aerospace block set for the stuff that we'll be doing in Aero 206. But there's a lot of great toolboxes. I encourage you to read about them and if it's something that you might want go ahead and install it um, and if you're not sure you can always come back later and install it later so okay so we've got the MATLAB window open here this is the command window in front of me where I can type in commands and see the outputs we've got the folder that we're working in the workspace where our variables be stored and the history of all the commands that I've typed there as well um, before you get started, a good thing to do would be to come up to Preferences and um, you can change the fonts to a decent sized font for whatever you're doing. You can change the colors in the MATLAB window if you want to. And in particular, something I like to do is come to the editor debugger here and look up code folding. And I'll show you what this is when we uh, start using the editor. But I would enable all the code folding because it helps you uh, to organize your code a little bit better. Okay, So here I am. I've got my cursor in the command window in MATLAB. And basically, I can use MATLAB in its most basic form as a calculator. So I can type in 2 plus 2 and get the answer. And I'll see the answer pop up as a variable here in the workspace called answer. And that little icon next to it tells me it's an array. And I can do things with the answer now that that answer is stored in memory. I can do with things with it by typing an answer as the variable and then saying answer times two and I get a new answer. All right. So at its most basic form, I can just treat it as a calculator and type in commands. I can also access basic math functions like cosine uh, or sine or exponential or log 10 uh, or anything like that. Okay. Every time I do that, I'm generating an answer, and MATLAB is storing that answer as a variable. I can create other variables just by using letters and setting them equal to a number. Now I've got a new variable in my workspace called A. Um, I can create a new variable called B, and then I can do math with those variables, A plus B, and I'll get an answer that's 5, or I can do C equals A plus B. And now I have a variable called C in the workspace as well. Okay, So I can explore these variables by double clicking on them and it will let me uh, look into the variable a little bit more. This is really handy when I have a variable that's an array uh, or a matrix. Uh, in this case these variables are arrays but they're just size one by one and they just contain one value. So I can close this little window here You'll notice that every time I typed in uh, an equation like C equals A plus B, it uh, repeated the output here in the command window. And I can suppress that by putting a semicolon after it. And um, I'm going to access my last command by pressing the up arrow. So that takes me back to my last command. Then I add a semicolon after it. And now um, I don't see the output in the command window, but I can still see it in the workspace. So if I called it D, then I would see a new variable called D pop up in the workspace. Okay. 
Um, so we've talked about how to use these uh, stored variables and calling uh, built-in functions. Uh, you know, MATLAB stands for Matrix Laboratory. It works best with working with matrices or arrays. Uh, so I can create a matrix. Um, I'll just use the capital letter A, and I'll create a magic uh, three by three matrix. Okay, so first thing to note is the capital letter A is different than the lowercase a. Uh, MATLAB variable names are case sensitive. Uh, this gave me a three by three matrix where all the rows and columns add up to be the same number. Now I can access different numbers in this array by using the row and column of the number I want to access. So let's say that I want to access the seven in the array to do something with it. I can type in the variable name, use parentheses, and I'm going to type in row number two, column number three, and it's going to return the value that's in that row and column. Uh, so an easy way to remember how this works is it's, you know, row column RC, and I just remember RC aircraft, that helps me keep it straight. The row comes first, the column comes second. And when I uh, call a value in that um, position in the array, then I can do other things with it. Uh, whatever I need to uh, in my script or in my code. And I can also um, use that to set uh, values in an array to a particular number. So I, I can say a2 times 3 equals 10. And now I don't have a magic array anymore. But I s change that value to be the number I want it to be. So that's very important because we're going to be doing that a lot to store information in arrays uh, where we want them, okay? And I can also open up this array now and see that I've got all of these numbers here in, in the array, and I can also directly edit it here. I can change this nine to a three, and then close this, and then when I call up that um, uh, array A in memory, I can see that it saved it, and position three comma two is the number three now, like I uh, set it to. Now we're going to um, make a script, and a script is nothing more than a set of commands that we could run one by one in the command window here, or we can put it in a script and run it all together as a script. Okay, so I'm gonna come over into my current folder here, which is in my working directory that you see across the top here and um, I can make a new folder if I want to, uh, or I can make a new script, and we're gonna use a script, not a live script. Live scripts are great for presentation of simple material, but um, we're gonna stick with scripts. It's a basic text file. It's easy to open, not just in MATLAB, but in Notepad and look at, uh, and it's a lot more powerful in terms of um, using functions and different uh, classes and stuff. Okay, so I'm going to create a new script here and I'm going to call it Lesson 1 Demo and I'm going to double click this script and it opens up in this uh, editor window here uh, which is another window that uh, could be docked in MATLAB or it could be undocked the way I have it. If I want to dock it, I'll click up here and dock the editor and now it's um, inside the main MATLAB program window. I usually prefer to use it undocked uh, because I'm usually working with these things side by side and looking at what's going on in the workspace and using the command window here to help me debug while I'm looking at you know my script over here on the other side. Okay so um, just a note about the file name that I used here. You see I used an underscore. Um, uh, dashes will throw an error in MATLAB. It needs underscores. Um, also, you can't start the file name with a number. It has to start with a letter. Same thing as a variable here. I couldn't create a variable called one var. Um, that's not a valid expression, but I could create a variable called var1 and set it equal to five. So we can't start file names or variables uh, with numbers, and we have to stick to underscores in the file names. Okay, The file uh, itself, as I alluded to or, uh, earlier, is just a plain text file. You can open it in MATLAB or anything else and access it and look at it. Okay, 
So now I've got this um, uh, script over here called Lesson 1 Demo, and I can just uh, put my commands in this script and run them, like a equals 2 plus 2, and run it. But the problem I'm going to run into here is that I've already got a variable called a in my workspace, and now I'm setting another variable uh, called a to a different value. And you always want to avoid that. So anytime you're starting with a script, you always want to start with the command clear to uh, clear the workspace and CLC to clear the command window. And when I run these, I'll type them in here so you can see what happens. Clear clears the workspace and CLC clears the command window. Some people also uh, prefer to put uh, close all at the top of their uh, scripts that closes all figure windows that are open that we'll get into later. I don't do that. I prefer to clear my figure windows on demand as I create my figures, but it's up to you. All right, so, um, so now I can run this uh, script, but there's an asterisk there you know, indicating I haven't saved it, so I'll hit Control S to save it. And now, you know, the easiest way to run it is to hit the Run button here, and I see the variable A appear in my workspace here with a value of 4. So I know that my script is working, and it cleared out everything that was there before. In general, uh, in a script, we want uh, one command per line. So I can type commands like this. And we'd like to have one uh, per line. Uh, obviously, I have uh, two commands on the top line there, clear CLC, and that's an exception because those two are easy to put together. But in general, you want to have one command per line. In general, you want to suppress the output from each line. If I don't suppress the output from each line, then I'm going to have stuff like this appearing in my command window. Um, sometimes that's fine when you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out what's going on with your script. Um, but you want to watch out, especially when you have large amounts of information or large amounts of uh, data stored in an array. If you don't for if you don't suppress the output of a line, that array could be printing to the command window, and it's going to eat up a lot of time. So, in general, you want to suppress the output uh, from each command. And then, if you need to explore something later, come back here in the workspace and double click on it and explore the variable as you need to. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about, uh, you know, having some mistakes in my code here. Uh, so I'm going to say D equals C divided by E, okay? And now I'm going to run this, and it doesn't know what E is because I don't have any variable in my workspace called E. So it throws an error. The errors are pretty descriptive. You just got to read them. Um, and then it generally does a really good job telling you where the error is. In this case, it's in this file on line 8. And I highly recommend turning on uh, line numbering here if you go to View. And um, turn on line numbers. And you can also highlight the current line. That's helpful sometimes. So that'll help you track down the error, and if you click on line 8, uh, it'll take you right to line 8 and put your cursor at the start of that line so you can try to figure out what's going on. And in this case, it's pretty obvious there's no variable called E. So um, Now, if I do this, I'm dividing by nothing, and then I've got a semicolon. And if you look closely, there's a squiggly underline there, kind of like you know Microsoft Word when you have a misspelling. It's the same concept. There's something wrong with your code here when you see that line. And you can hover over it, and you can see in this case it's a parse error, which means it's just having trouble parsing the line because it's expecting to divide by something, but there's nothing there, and instead it hits the end of the line, the semicolon, and that's an invalid syntax. So you can read that. If I tried to run this, um, it would give me more information about the error, and I could click on it. And again, it would actually take me to the right column uh, where the error occurs. And I can see that I need to put something in here in order to run it. And then I can run my code, and there's no errors from the code after that. Okay, something else that's pretty handy is, um, you know, in general, some best practices for coding is you want to use uh, variable names that are 
uh, short but descriptive. So as long as they need to be to be descriptive, obviously A, B, C, D here isn't really describing what these are. And then when possible, you want to include units uh, in the variable name as well. So let's say A was uh, pressure and it was in uh, pounds per square foot. I could rename A here pressure P for pressure or I can name it press for pressure and I could do underscore pounds per square foot. And that's really descriptive, right? There's no um, confusing that this variable is pressure in this unit. And now it's giving me a prompt here. I can press shift enter to rename all the other places where I used A to this new variable name. And that's really handy because when you come back through your code and you want to rename something, you can press shift enter and all of that will get renamed to the new variable name. Okay, so just a quick um, preview on debugging, which is just exactly what it sounds like. We're trying to figure out where the bugs are in the code. So MATLAB has a whole debugging mode that's um, you enable just by clicking on the line number here and it's highlighted that uh, line 4 and it's going to pause execution of the script at line 4 and let us analyze what's in the workspace and then we can step through the rest of the code as we want to. So if I press run now uh, the code is paused here and you can see there's nothing in the workspace and if I press step it's going to the, go to the next line and I see that my pressure value is in the workspace now but there's nothing else there and if I continue to step I can see how the code evolves um, the command window is in the debug mode uh, for the K here indicates the keyboards in control and the status down here says paused and debugger so I can analyze things like I can type in B or I could do other things to investigate my code while it's in debug mode um, or I can even change what B is equal to to fix something and then I could come back in here and continue to step through my code and it always indicates what, what, line, I'm, what line I'm on uh, until I'm done and now I see the results from that. So if I want to turn that off I can clear the pause on line 4 and that will go back into normal um, execution mode. Okay. Uh, in addition to uh, pressing the play button up here I can also press F5 uh, to run this. In addition to using the debugger, I can just evaluate things, uh, lines or sections of lines directly in the command window. So I can highlight this information. I can right click and say evaluate selection in the command window, F9. And it's going to send that command to the command window and evaluate it. So this is really handy. I uh, find myself in the habit of using F9 a lot. Um, so I can clear this here and I can highlight this whole line and press F9 and I can step through lines uh, manually on my own using F9 and it gives you a little bit more fle flexibility with what you can do in the command window um, instead of being stuck in the debugger mode but F9 is extremely handy as well. The other important thing that we need to talk about is commenting. Okay, Commenting is um, putting some text in your code that doesn't affect the execution of the code. It's not commands or variables, it's just information for the reader, which normally is you uh, or me, but really the way you should think about it is uh, you're leaving comments for your future self who might come back and uh, use part of this code again or um, use portions of it in other future code um, or if you pass your code on to somebody else, somebody else really needs to know um, what you were thinking when you wrote it and that's where comments come in. So the way we create a comment is just by putting the percent sign at the start and then typing a comment and it uh, appears in green in this color scheme at least and this doesn't affect the execution of the code. I can still hit play here and nothing changes. Okay. In addition I can put comments at the end of a line so I can say here pressure um, and then I'm going to put some units here, pounds per foot squared, okay? And so this is really useful. Uh, commenting at the end of the line, an inline comment is really useful for 
uh, making sure that it's really clear uh, what the variable is. Um, don't just rely on the variable name. That's good. And commenting is absolutely required too. Whether or not the semicolon is there won't affect um, how the comment works. I'll press F5 and this thing runs again. And without the semicolon, it um, outputted to the command window, but uh, it didn't, didn't interfere with the comment or anything. Okay. Commenting is absolutely essential to good code, and it's going to be part of how I'm grading your code. Now, a percent sign creates a single comment. A double percent sign um, also creates a comment line, uh, but now it defines a cell in the code. So this is a cell in the code, and now I can come down here and do double percents and say that this is um, another cell. Okay, so I can have some more code down here, um, like that. Okay, and cells are really useful because now I can break my code up into uh, chunks that make sense. Maybe I'm initializing some variables at the top. Maybe I'm doing um, some initial math or setting up one function, or maybe I've got a cell that's got my core code in it, and then I've got another cell later on that contains all my plotting commands, and um, uh, also called sections, so I can run this section uh, by clicking this button, and so you can see this section down here didn't run, there's no variable called E in the workspace, or what is really convenient is just to press control enter, and then I'll put the cursor down here and press control enter again, and now I see the variable E pop up. So. I use cells a lot, uh, or sections, and they're very handy, and executing a chunk of code at a time by pressing Control enter is very handy too, and it lets you inspect everything in the workspace as you go to make sure it's making sense. Okay, there's some other uh, stuff up here across. I'm just going to maximize this, uh, but in addition, we've got this Publish menu here. And this is a really easy way to publish your code and the results uh, to a PDF. So if I publish this, pop up with a PDF. And uh, this is my code. It will contain key outputs, uh, such as um, any text that you print in your code or any figures that you create. They'll automatically be embedded at the right point uh, in the PDF. You can see that um, when I created a cell, it kind of treated it as a header in the code. So that's a nice thing about using a cell in the code. Uh, and this is a really nice way to turn in your results. And this is how I'm asking you to turn in your results as well uh, for our projects when it's appropriate. Um, sometimes you'll have to write down some other stuff in a Word type document and save that as a PDF, but then you can just attach this PDF to that PDF and turn in one product at the end. But this is usually a great way to publish your code. I can read it, I can copy it out and run part of it if I needed to, uh, which I generally won't do, uh, but I can see the key outputs, I can see the figures and stuff like that. So. Highly recommend um, using the uh, publish command. And if you go to edit publishing options here, uh, you want to change the output file format to PDF. I think HTML is the default if I remember right. Okay, And then in view here, you've got a lot of stuff um, that you can do. You can uh, do split views, uh, top bottom, like this, or you can go back to single view. You can do um, left, right, and turn on your line numbers like we talked about. And now, going back to that code folding that I mentioned earlier, you can see I've got this um, box with a minus sign in it here and a line that extends the length of this cell. And I can click on this and fold up that piece of the code, um, or I can expand it using the buttons up here as well. And that really helps me to organize my code because if I've got a cell that I'm not using a whole lot, I'm pretty confident that it's correct. I'll just fold it up and I'll stay down here on the cell that I need to work on. If I need to run this cell, I can still come back and click on this line and press Control Enter and it will still run the cell even though it's folded up. So it's really useful and folding it up is really useful to help you keep your code organized as well. 
Okay, so uh, where do we go when we need help? And that's the great part about MATLAB is um, all the documentation is very thorough and it's all available to you through this search bar up here. And so let's say I wanted to know a little bit more about how to use this log10 function or if there's any other um, options that I could use with it. I can come up here and search log10 and the MATLAB documentation window is going to open uh, with the search results and then I can click on the log10 function. And this is the syntax of the function. Obviously this is how I was using it where the input x comes into the function in parentheses and the output y is on the left side of the function here. And I can read more about this function and I can see if there's uh, a lot of times there's optional inputs to a function that you could read about um, and you'd want to know more about the output of the function. This would be the place uh, to come. In addition to using the search feature up here, I can type help log 10 and it'll just uh, give me the basics about the um, function where I can type doc log 10 and it'll open up the documentation for that function as well. And this is all easily searchable uh, on Google as well. If I come to your search engine, if I just type in MATLAB log 10, it's going to uh, bring me right to MathWorks website and I'm going to be using the online, online documentation. So sometimes I find myself uh, just Googling and reading the MATLAB documentation, even though it's right there inside of MATLAB itself as well. Another great resource for you is the MATLAB Fundamentals document, which is in um, uh, our team site, and this has been developed in DFAN over a lot of time. It's 44 pages long. There's a ton of stuff in here on a lot of different functions. Um, if you want to know more about something, this is a great, great place to come and browse or control F and look for whatever it is you're looking for. Okay. Um, in particular, there's an example in here of a header. Uh, so a header is a block of comments that we put at the top of the code to give all of the various metadata that helps the user understand what the code is doing. Okay. These are the guidelines for a header in the MATLAB fundamentals. Um, you know, name of the um, script, author, inputs, outputs, constants, local variables, references, and documentation. Um, that's pretty thorough. Um, I'm providing you an example in the team site of my sample code. I'm giving you a lot of samples in here that we'll work through over time and figure out how to use. But the first part of my sample code that I'm providing you is my header. This is my header that I use for all my code and the way I use it is when I'm creating a new script I'll control C this and I will put it at the top of my new script and I'll change everything to be appropriate for my new script. Okay. Starts out at the top with a title, a description of the code, some information about who and when it was created. Um, I don't list out every single input. I just list, list the key inputs to kind of give the reader an idea of what it does along with the key outputs. If the output's a plot or a spreadsheet, then I just say those are the outputs. I'd like to list the external dependencies. So these are functions that are not included in MATLAB, so like cosine, sine, and log10, those are all internal functions in MATLAB. Um, I don't really care about listing all of those dependencies, but if I'm referencing another function that I made, then I like to list that so I make sure I'm aware of it. I think it's really uh, good to put the references here uh, just in a simple kind of citation format. Um, and then a documentation statement. And then what is especially useful is just to put out, put down some basic instructions on how to run the code here. So if this was a function, I would put down an example function call here. And that would be useful because then I can just copy and paste it back out later and be off to the races with my function call operating the way it's supposed to. Um, sometimes the you know usage instructions are just as simple as putting your inputs and run the code. Uh, and if that's as simple as it, is, as it is, I still put that here for completeness. So this is the quality of header that I'm expecting to see 
uh, in your code that you're, you turn in. I've given it to you as an example, so there's no reason for you not to use it. And hopefully you'll find it useful and you'll keep using it in future classes as well. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we'll jump into project one. And I'm not going to update this header right now for the sake of time, but you can update that yourself. I am going to bring up um, project one. Okay, so what we're doing in project one is we're calculating the Bruguet range equation for a jet aircraft, uh, given the parameters here and the equations given here for you as well. Okay, the project split up into two parts. And um, the idea here being that you'd work on the first part on the, in the first lesson, work on the second part in the second lesson, and then it'd be ready to turn in on the morning of the third lesson. Okay, so uh, part one here is creating a basic uh, M file script with a header block. We've already gone over what the header block should look like. And now we want to create a block of code that initializes all of the inputs um, with comments specifying the name and units of each variable. Okay, so this is where I would come up here and I'd put a clear CLC at the top of my code. And then I would put a comment here and say initialize inputs. Okay. Now there is a function in MATLAB for the user to interactively put in the inputs, okay? And I can um, type in help input here. And this is the interactive function that prompts the user for an input. Uh, and when it does that, it returns the result into a variable name uh, that the user has to type into the command window. And that gets really old because you have to type in these numbers over and over. And it really defeats the purpose of having a pre-programmed script anyway. So I find that I've rarely uh, found an appropriate time to use this interactive user input. A uh, much better way is just to list the inputs here in the code in, um, you know, the first cell of the code or, you know, first uh, couple cells, wherever it's appropriate in the code. Okay. And so we need to initialize all the inputs. So for example, one of the inputs here is density. So I'm going to call uh, density row and I'm going to give it units of slugs feet cubed. Okay, just something to remind me of that. And I'm going to say that it equals 0 0.000735. Going to suppress the output. I'm going to tab over to a nice location where I can line up all my inline comments. And I'm going to say density. And I'm going to put the units, uh, and I can type them out a little bit better over here. And that's the first input. Okay, I'm going to keep doing this with all the other inputs. Plan form area is S, of course. And uh, it's in square feet. So I can set that equal to 385. Tab over to the same place and then say plan form area square feet. Okay. Um, and now everything is really clear, the units are really clear, and there's just uh, absolutely no mistaking uh, what's going on. So uh, this is the best way to initialize the inputs in my opinion. You can come back later and change these numbers or we'll change them programmatically um, as we need to. Okay. And now you're going to have to calculate the range in nautical miles. So for it, I would get down with, get done with all my inputs up here. I could create a new cell, say calculate range. And then in this case, I'm not going to type in the whole thing, but you can see the equation here. The square root function is um, just available with SQRT. If I wasn't sure of that, I could come up here and search the documentation square root and um, it would uh, pop up with a suggested function here, square root, and I can see the answer there. Anyway, uh, so in the case of the range equation, it's the square root of 2 divided by rho times s. But I need, I'm going to put in rho, um, the whole name of my variable is rho underscore slugs feet cubed, and you can see it's suggesting this. It's popped up with a little uh, input here because it recognizes that variable from my other code and it also has um, a suggestion here and, and I can just press tab here and will, it will auto-complete that variable name. 
and then I can go times s and here's my uh, s variable here where I can just type it in myself and that's the first part of the uh, range equation um, the range equation is a manageable equation I, I can keep typing in uh, the rest of it uh, here as I go of course I don't have this variable c sub t yet I would have to initialize it up here but you want to make your code look presentable so I'm using spaces uh, before and after the equal sign I'm using spaces between you know major uh, portions of the equation um, I'm being careful that my parentheses are all matched up. If there's an opening parenthesis, there needs to be a closing parenthesis. If there's not, there's going to be an error. Okay, so if I remove one of these closing parentheses, if I run this section up here, and then I run, well, let's get the command window back here. Um, when I run this section up here, it's already giving me an error because um, even though I'm running this section up here, it's looking down and it's seeing that there's an unmatched parenthesis down here so if I click on this it takes me exactly where it is and if I fix that error then I can come back up here and run that cell it cleared everything and initialized these two variables and then I can come down here and run this cell and see the output here R okay except um, uh, R is acceptable for the output variable name um, I could also call it range uh, you can get into a tricky situation if I called it all lowercase range. There is a function in MATLAB called range where it just returns the range of a number. If I set a variable called range, I wouldn't be able to use this function called range anymore. But if I set a variable called capital range, uh, it wouldn't interfere with the use of this internal function range. Um, in general, you know, I like to use variable names that are as short as possible, still being uh, descriptive. R here is, since this whole thing's about range, R is pretty descriptive. That it's what we're looking for. Except I want to add some units here. This is R and nautical miles. Okay, and that brings up a good point. You'll need to watch your units in the range equation. The units on thrust specific fuel consumption are in one over hours, but there's actually seconds hidden here in uh, the force of weight, pounds force, force is a mass times an acceleration, so it's actually slugs times feet per second squared. So these units uh, in this variable are incompatible with this equation right now, so you need to convert those. And you want your answer to be in terms of nautical miles anyway, so that you can compare your answer with mine. In addition to filling out the whole equation for range here, I'd put a semicolon at the end. This equation is going to be pretty long, so I'm probably going to use up the whole line. So I'm probably going to use a line above it to add a comment. And my comment here is going to be calculate range in nautical miles. Um, and then I'm going to reference the equation that I'm using, which is yuck out equation 3.58. This is absolutely essential. When you get to a point in your code where you're referencing a key equation that came from an external source. Just put down um, the author's name, which should correspond to the reference up here that you used, and the equation number. So somebody else could go back and look up the equation to make sure that uh, you programmed it incorrectly. Uh, incorrectly. Okay, the other thing that we need to do is um, use the fprintf function to output the answer to the nearest whole number in the command window. Okay. So I'm going to suppress the output from range, um, the output from this number. And again, this isn't the whole equation. I'm just trying to be brief. Uh, but now I want to output some text to the user in the command window saying something a little bit more descriptive about what the range is. And to do that, I can use the fprintf command. And again, for help on fprintf, uh, we can just come here and we can read about it. Okay, so it's going to write formatted data to a text file. In this case, we're just going to write it to the screen, but we can also use it to write it to a text file. And we can open up the documentation for fprintf by clicking there, and we can go straight to the um, function in the documentation. And there's a ton of documentation for this function because it can do a ton of stuff. Okay, But in, at its basic, where uh, fprintf is a way of outputting a mix of uh, characters and numbers 
in a way that makes sense to the user, whether it's in a file or on the screen. So I'm going to create a character right here by putting in an apostrophe. And I'm going to type in a sentence. The range of the aircraft is, I want to put in a number here. Okay, I'm just going to put in blanks for now, nautical miles. Okay, so now we need to figure out programmatically how do we insert the answer that's in this variable in this blank here. And the way that we do that is by using uh, format spe specification. Okay, and if we come down here, um, this tells us everything that we need to know about our format specification. It starts off with a percent. And we're going to specify some uh, field widths, some precision, and then um, the uh, type of uh, number that we want to print, which would be if we're going to use a floating point number, which is F. So if I type in 0.2F, okay, it's going to give me the range with a minimum field width of zero. In other words, it'll only use the number of characters that it absolutely needs to to print the number. It'll use uh, two decimal places in the floating point notation. And now I need to send this percent um, uh, character here creates a special value in the fprintf statement. Now I need to send it the variable that I want it to print. So I'm going to type in r in nautical miles. Okay, so comma, the variable name, and it's going to get formatted like this, output in this sentence to the screen. So now if I press control enter, I can see here the answer is the range of the aircraft is 2.66 nautical miles. But it, it's not so great because it printed it right before the command prompt and now my command prompt's shoved over and that's horrible. Okay, So there's a bunch of special characters that you can print off in the fprintf command. One of them is uh, slash n and that creates a new line. So I'm going to do a new line before and after this uh, fprintf statement. And now when I press control n it put a new line before the statement and a new line after the statement, which makes the output a little, a lot more clear uh, in the command window. Okay, so that's a little bit about using the fprintf uh, command. I encourage you to read the documentation, read the other kind of special characters uh, that you can output as well. But that's uh, basically how you uh, satisfy that part of the part one of the project. Okay. And uh, just one other note on the string that I created here. A string is just a sequence of characters. Okay, so if I uh, create a variable called s, and I called it this is a string, okay, s is saved as that string, and I can see up here it's called a character array. If I double click on this variable, um, that is the character array. It's an array of those characters and spaces it spells out. This is a string. So that's going to come in handy later. That's pretty much it for uh, lesson one, and I'll see you in class.